Hello everyone, I'm finally back after three long weeks of being missing. And that is because I've been traveling a lot and uh, I'm finally back in town where I can do my live streams on Saturday like normal. And I'm looking forward to doing some editing during the month of June. I've been working in the background trying to get everything set up properly to take care of you guys. So first off, uh, please let me know that you can hear this okay. And I'm going to grab a few more things. I'm going to walk off camera. You can just stare at the tank for a minute. And I'm going to grab all my <clears throat> Apex gear that I wanted to show you guys. So, let me do that. Can you guys hear me okay? One more minute. Sorry, I didn't have everything by the camera. So many boxes. Okay. Got myself a good pile. And I want to grab a water bottle. Not sure I'll get thirsty during this stream. Okay, sound is good. Glad to see that. Thank you very much, everyone, for letting me know. So, uh, where do we start? Let me uh, adjust this a little bit more. Oh, that's as low as we can go with that. Let's see if we can switch this one a little bit lower. There we go. Um, all right, so the whole point of this topic is going to be about the apex. And so I just want to kind of jump into it, but there's things I want to talk about first. Tank's doing great. Um, the entire system has been just pretty much seamless. And I've been able to benefit from owning the Trident, which is that device that measures alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. I'm a little breathless from running around. <laughs> the setup always is such a rush. Um, and because of the Trident measuring so frequently, I can actually make sure that my alkalinity is staying pretty much the same number all the time, which I've been sticking around 9.3, and I'm really happy about that. So... But that's going to be part of the Apex stuff. I just wanted to tell you about that. I'm still dosing no pox. When I checked my alkalinity, um, my nitrates last, they were measuring about 20 on the API test kit. So they haven't come down further yet. And I'm hoping that'll happen soon. All right. And yes, I still do have my uh, perfugium going. Reef and Dive, thank you very much for the super chat. That was awesome. I, I didn't expect that. I haven't even done anything yet to earn it. <laughs> <laughs> besides be here. So let's start off with the Apex. And I've got a couple things I want to do here. Let me hide a couple things on my desktop that are absolutely unnecessary for you guys to see. And let's see. I'll get rid of this. Get rid of this. I want to open up Apex Fusion. And I want to close that. Why would I have that? And I'm hoping that I can do something nifty here with Apex Fusion. All right, so first of all, what we're going to do, now that I've got that ready, Shrink that window down a little bit and hide this. <laughs> My desktop is way too busy considering I just rebooted the machine. All right, there is Ecamm Live, which is what we use to stream with. And okay, so that right there, I'm going to walk over there because I'm assuming you can still hear me okay. And this right here is the brain of the Apex. This is the newer version. Uh, that came out a few years ago. Before that, there was something longer, just a long rectangular brick-looking thing that was designed to plug everything in, just like this one, and it was called Plastic. And I ran that for many, many years, and I only switched to this one a few months ago. So you can actually do this to see inside and see all the connections underneath. And we've got power cable, battery backup, uh, PH, ORP, Ethernet, uh, my breakout box, the one link which should be used for the Trident, and then I have an uh, Aquabus cable here as well, which is another way to fuel the power to it, which is actually the main way most people hook it up. Get back in the little spot where it was. Alright, so that is the brain. Then over here, I think I'm going to have to hold this free hand just to make this make more sense. Tripod's not going to cooperate the way I want it to. Over here is the 832, 
which is the larger power supply that you get with the Apex, which has up to eight outlets, plus it has some extra ports here on the side to plug in. Hope you guys can see that okay. And then above it, I have an EV4. I know it's black and dark, so I don't know if you can see that okay, but I have one over here that you can totally see. And this one is another energy bar, EV8, because there's eight outlets, and I've completely maxed it out with all the things I need for this aquarium over here. Um, this is being connected with an Aquabus cable that goes behind the door, over the frame, down the wall, and into one of these energy bars over here. Additionally, way up high in that back corner is another EV8, and that one is designed to run all the lighting for the entire room. So that one also has an Aquabus cable that goes all the way from that light, across the ceiling, down the wall, underneath, and comes and plugs into this. All right, let me switch back to the other camera now. Okay. Hey, Tulsa Area Reef Club, thank you for the super chat. And Martin, thank you for the super chat. You guys are awesome. So now that, now that you've seen the uh, different components, I thought we'd talk about what they actually do and how they work. So. You have two ways of connecting the Apex up to your network, your uh, way of communicating with it. And one is going to be Wi-Fi, and the other is going to be hardwired. I myself prefer hardwired always whenever I'm doing anything because there's less risk of something going wrong. So when you set up everything, you're going to have to choose, do I want to run an Ethernet cable? Can I run it from my router all the way to my Apex? Or do you need to use Wi-Fi? Or do you need to use some kind of a Wi-Fi repeater, which is even worse because it's another point of failure. So I'm hearing lots of good things about the Wi-Fi that's built in. Of course, everyone has a different circumstance and life can be a little complicated. But for the most part, once you got it plugged in and you've got your probes unwrapped and installed in your sump, you can start going through the setup configuration and get everything, you know, operating right out of the box. And the nice thing is when you buy it, you know, you're going to get... This, let's see, this is it, I believe. This is the big box you would get. And inside of it, it would have all the goodies. Now, my box is completely empty because I used it. <laughs> but you've got a comprehensive guide in there that will show you, not inside here, but I mean on the website, on Neptune Systems, that will take you step by step through everything. And a lot of people feel like, oh my God, it's going to be so complicated and hard. And it really isn't. So let's just talk about dollars. The Apex system... Uh, brand new with everything is roughly 800 bucks and you can always add more features to it that cost more and more and more money there's also an apex le version which is got a couple less features and it's 500 dollars. but just owning even the le will benefit your reef tank despite its size and i'll tell you while i was in minneapolis two weeks ago i went to visit a guy who had a 12 gallon aquarium it was beautiful, and at some point you guys are going to see it, because I filmed it. But he had the entire Apex maxed out on this thing, making it super awesome, and it's 12 gallons. So the tank size does not dictate whether you own a controller. It's going to come down to your wallet and your peace of mind. And I have been running some version of a Neptune Systems controller on my aquarium since 2004. Before that, I just had mechanical timers, and I had to keep track of things, and I hoped for the best. So uh, once I got the Aqua controller and started learning how to use it, I'm actually kind of committed to a method that I live with all the time, which is I love to code my own gear. In other words, you create a module, and then inside there, I go automatically to advanced, and I start typing in, I want this, 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 this. But Apex has made it much simpler with tasks, where you can click tasks and then pick the topic, like add the ATK, and it'll step-by-step -step show you what to do, how to do it, and program it and upload it all at once to the cloud and it's done versus having to actually physically create your own manual code like I love to do. So I want you to realize you can make it complicated, but you can keep it super simple. And the Neptune community uh, forum is full of helpful information and helpful people. If you're running into questions, there's always someone online that can assist. And there's also a, a group on Facebook where people help each other out. 
And worst case, you call up Neptune Systems and you ask for some technical support and they help you over the phone, I guess. So, I mean, there's lots of ways to get some assistance. So don't feel like I couldn't do it myself. Now, because this audience is international, I know there's already um, a hurdle to overcome for those in other countries where they may not be able to get this or they can't get the kind they want or it's not as modern as what we have here in the U.S. And there's absolutely nothing I can do about that. <laughs> Uh, APEC or Neptune Systems is well aware of what people want in other countries, but they are, I mean, reality is they're going to focus on the market where they're making the money. And if they sell a ton of stuff in the U.S., that would make sense. They would focus on the U.S. They haven't eliminated Europe and other countries. They just don't quite have the same accessories we do, and that's just how it is. All right. Now, let's talk about some actual pieces or components. So I grabbed a couple of things I had laying around here because I always have a stash. This is one of the energy bars I was talking about before, and it's got eight outlets. Now, these six on this energy bar are standard outlets that turn on and off. And, I mean, they'll do whatever you want, but my point is they can handle whatever you plug in. These two on the end are designed to handle low voltage. So, for example, if you put in like a computer fan to blow water across your sump, that's going to use like 3, 5, 10 watts of power. It's so little, one of these probably would have a hard time turning it off. But plugging into the low voltage outlet, it can turn it on and off with no problem and turn off that fan and turn it back on. Uh, this might work for a very small, minimal top-off system. This could work for like a moonlight. You know, the things that just normally use so little juice, it's hard to trigger them to off. So that's why they made it that way. On the bottom here are a whole bunch of what you would think are USB ports. I have to tell you, because even I'm confused, these are not USB ports. No matter how much they look like one, they're not. And so everyone thinks I can plug a wire in there and I can charge my phone, or I can plug a wire in there and I can hook up a webcam, or I can plug a... No, this is literally only to daisy chain other energy bars and components nearby. It is literally, it's not power, it's a... Uh, continuity type situation. There's no juice going through it. And that being said, some people might want to just use a regular USB cable to connect instead of using what's called an Aquabus cable. And for the most part, I think you're going to run into problems. I, I'm not 100% sure. I try to stick with the gear that they sell for their equipment so that way I don't make any mistakes and I eliminate potential issues. But if you um, don't have enough of the Aquabus cables, you can always order more, and they come in different lengths. So here is an example of an Aquabus cable. And this one here is uh, 15 feet, and it is uh, female to male. So that way you can work from here. Actually, this one here is an extension cable that I got intentionally, so that way the short, normal, standard size cable is 6 feet. This gives me another 15. I can plug it in. Now I can go 21 feet. And I can get to a further distance for one of those energy bars. Um, this one here is even longer. I believe this is a 30-foot cable I've got in here. And this is a straight male-to-male -male connection. So plug it in, go 30 feet, plug it in. And now whatever is hooked up way over there can, be continue, uh, can, can, can run. So why would you need something 30 feet away? What if you had multiple tanks and you wanted to track the data of multiple tanks? Well, one apex can actually do that. You can have one brain and you can set up uh, devices for a frag tank that's standalone. You could set it up for a species tank that's all by itself. You can set it up for your main reef. And it's all contingent upon components. So, you know, when you buy the brand new one out of the box, it's going to control your main tank. But then as you say, well, I really want to know what's going on with that tank over there, you buy something called a PM1, which is a module. And on that module is a Aquabus port or USB port looking thing. Hook that PM1 to your main system. And now all of a sudden you now have the ability to measure more pH and more ORP or more temperature. I think it's temperature and pH, actually, not ORP. So now you've got the ability to, in my, ta in my uh, tank, in my case, I have the 400 gallon reporting uh, temperature, pH, salinity, and ORP. And then on my frag tank, it's measuring pH and temperature, and uh, I think that's it. Let's see if I can see what else it's got here. It's behind everything I can't see. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that's the only two I'd check on that one. Now, if I wanted to run another tank somewhere else, I get another PM1 module. So what do these modules look like? Most of them are going to look like this thing right here. So this is the FMM module, the fluid monitoring module. And this one here can be used to measure flow going through a pipe. So you can hook up a device through these little ports on the bottom. There's a whole row of them right there. And then it would measure how many gallons per hour are going through a pipe. And some people like to set up their system to tell them, uh, you know, for example, let's say they normally see 300 gallons an hour, and that's a very round number. Usually it's going to be like 281 uh, going through the pump all the time. If it starts to get slower and slower, that could indicate that the pump is getting clogged up. If uh, it's just reporting way too low, maybe the pump has failed or has become obstructed and no more liquid is moving through it. This is very useful for people like my buddy uh, in Seattle who has a separate frag tank and he wants to make sure the water is flowing there from the main reef. And if there's no flow coming out, he knows there's something going on and he checks on the frag tanks. And he gets a notification on his phone saying there's a problem. Plus he can just look at the dashboard and he can see what's going on. Let me show you the dashboard. i got to figure out how to do this really fast. So we've got this one right here. And I was doing this before. Of course, it won't do what I wanted. But, um, yeah. Hang on. Sorry, guys. I had this set up to work a certain way, and it wasn't cooperating. So might be easier for me. I'm just going to do this. This and then I this. The problem with doing things on a live stream, right? You never know what's going to happen or if it's going to cooperate. And it did not do what I was wanting it to do. So, Fish Tank Barn, thank you very much for the super chat. All right. So I grabbed that right quick and I'm going to now figure out how to add that thing. I hid my extra windows that I needed. Overlays? Yes, here we go. And then we're going to add a overlay. OK, so I stuck this on the screen. That was the easiest way to do this for you guys. Um, and if you're looking at this entire panel, what you're seeing in the upper section, and this scrolls down, by the way. It can go down another four inches or so. But this is showing on the left column, I've got my a saltwater feed button right here. So when I'm wanting to feed the tank, I press that big yellow button you guys have seen in other videos, and it will then stop the return pump and stop the skimmer. Underneath it is temperature, then pH, then salinity, which, by the way, don't worry about this number. It just is what it is. It's just something you want to track. And then ORP. And underneath that is cube flow. So this is showing the amount of flow on my Vortec in the anemone cube. And then I have my blue button, which I almost never use, and I have my white button that I use all the time. The blue button is a button, a physical button I can push. And when I push that button, it kills a whole bunch of stuff for the event I would want to do a water change and keeps everything turned off for 45 minutes. So it would turn off my skimmer, my return pump, my heaters, my alarms, my alerts, uh, my top off. All those things are disabled. And then after 45 minutes, they all come back to life because by then I've got water out and water in and I'm done. The white button is the one I use all the time, and that's to make my lights turn on behind me over here um, for an extra 10 minutes every single night. Because usually I am such a procrastinator feeding my fish, the lights are about to turn off, and I hit that button, and it makes the lights stay on for 10 more minutes. All right. Oh, see, now it wants to zoom in and out. It wouldn't do it before when I tried to do it with you guys. What the hell? So annoying. Okay, now in the middle here are all the things I use on my main reef. And so you've got the refugium light. You've got the little blue lighting I put above the refugium as well because the clown and the anemones look better with not pure white light all the time. My return pump, my two MP60s, my protein skimmer, the four inch cooling fan, uh, three heaters, the skimmer swabby, the XHO lighting, and then my metal halides are down here. And then over here on the far right is the Trident and it's showing the latest results as of 12 o'clock today. So two hours ago it measured and said my alkaline is at 9.2. 
and my uh, calcium is at 492 and my magnesium is around 1518. And then beneath that is my autotopo system, the ATK. The ATK will then constantly see if it's on or off. By the way, you'll notice a lot of things say on right now and other things say off. They physically are in the off state right now, but they're all set to auto. If you put something on off, it will always be off forever. If you put on on, it'll always be on forever. But if you set it to auto, and this is how your control board should always look, then things will trigger on and off based on the programming. All right. Let's see. I'm taking a look at some of these questions happening here. All right. Um, then finally over here on the lower section of the right column is going to be the frag tank. And it's got the skimmer, the heater, the return pump, the top off system. That's all plugged in. So that gets you set up with that. So let's switch to this. What are we frozen here? What the heck happened? Oh, you know what it is? It's the overlay. Turn this off. <laughs> Ta-da! I'm back. All right. So those are some of the parts. Now here is a used uh, energy bar eight, which had one dead outlet. It's dead, Jim. So I put a red shirt there. And again, it has the little small ports on the side there. The Aquabus cables, the one link cables, and uh, the other one, I don't know what it's called, the specific type of plug. And uh, you'll have little lights on the front that will show in which state these outlets are on. Now, compared to the other energy bar, all eight of these outlets do whatever you plug in. These aren't separated specifically for low voltage like on the original one. Now they can all do whatever they need to do. So I want to show you that and explain that to you really quick. Um, <clears throat> now we talked about uh, the ability to measure water moving through a pipe. So I thought I'd show you something fun. This is a flow meter. <laughs> it's a really big one. And you would plug this in. And it has one of these connectors, which would go in the FMM or the flow meter. And then as the water moves through, it'll make that little propeller spin. And as it's spinning, it's measuring how much water is going through the pipe. This one here, I believe, is inch and a half. So this would be for a larger turn pump. And they have smaller versions as well. <laughs> but uh, so this is something that people are using in their systems to make sure there's maximum flow at all times or to verify that the flow is occurring if, uh, you know, they're away. They can just double check things by looking on their Apex Fusion dashboard. I just have this pile of boxes. I have to look through them all. Um, unfortunately, I do not have another PM1 to show you. I wanted to, but my box is empty. I'm actually going to order a second one. I need another one. Then, show you a couple other things here. This is the temperature probe that would then go inside your sump or your display tank or your overflow box, wherever you like it the most. And this part does not come off. You just leave it on there and you just set it in the water. You can actually submerge the whole thing. I don't have mine like extended above the water. It, it literally goes down in the sump and it plugs in with this type of connector on the apex. And then something that you don't get anymore, but you might be able to order still possibly, that doesn't come with like by default, is the display. And this display has been around for a very long time and it plugs in with an Aquabus connector, no, let's say USB. And it will then let you see things on the screen and let you enter some buttons on here to man manually navigate through the uh, different menus. And it, it does come in handy. And I've always used one and that's why I have a second one in case mine fails. But there are other people have used something from a, uh, Amazon, some kind of a tablet that costs like 40, 50 bucks. And they use that as their display instead of buying the display module. So. It, if you can't get this, there's an alternative where you can just do the same thing anyway. And then here is a pH probe. 
that I bought a few years ago. And this one I do want to talk about. I've talked about pH probes in the past. Like I said, I bought this several years ago. It's probably toast because I didn't use it. Um, your, the rule of thumb when you buy a pH probe is that there should be a rubber tip on the end and there should be a liquid in there. And as you can see, mine is completely dried out. So this probe is probably dead. Um, it just is what it is. That's what happens when you hoard things and don't swap things out frequently enough. This is a BNC connector. It presses onto the apex and twists and locks into place. And this would measure pH. And in this case, you would stick this part in the water without the rubber cap. This is an extended one link cable, so it's super long. So if you had to put something further away that needed one link, they have that type of cable. You might be wondering why I have all these pieces. <laughs> here is another pH probe, a different brand, a different company. And as you can see, I still have liquid in here. So this probe is going to be intact and usable. And I wouldn't rely on that suction cup, I would toss it. This right here, is a power supply for the Apex. And what you do with one of these guys, this gets plugged, it's just a regular power brick with you know, a regular, uh, whatever you call these jacks. And it's used to keep giving the Apex power in the event of a power outage. So this thing would be plugged into a battery backup. And that way the Apex can still register that there's a problem while it's in battery backup mode because the main power went out. So in theory, if your router had a battery backup, and your Apex had a battery backup, you would be able to get a notification instantly via email or text saying your tank is offline and your, your tank is without power. And you could probably log into Fusion and you could see there's no flow going through the pipes because your flow meter measurements. Um, this right here is called an optical sensor has one of these jacks, again goes in the FMM, and this would then hold on to the tank, it's like if it went through a small acrylic bracket, you would tighten the nut to like lock it in place, and it would measure the water line in the sump, and if you need to add more water, this would open and send a signal to the apex, and then water be you know, be pumped back into the system, so it covers it, and it shuts off that pump again. This is part of the parts that they use for the ATK, which is the auto top-off kit. And since I mentioned ATK, the ATK. So you've got this gizmo, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> you got this gizmo right here that holds on to the inside of your sump magnetically. It's got a couple of optical sensors. It's got a float valve right back there. Here is your, mod I'm doing everything backwards. Here is your module that everything plugs into. You have your pump and you have your power supply with the tubing. So all of that comes in the box. And by the way, if you were buying just a top off kit, this can work by itself without the apex. So if you're like, well, I'm going to get an Apex one day, I might as well get the ATK. You could. And I'm using the ATK on my reef. Um, I believe, and then I've got here an energy bar four. So you saw the one with eight plugs. This one's four plugs. So I started to say, I bet you're wondering why I have so many pieces. I had this plan that I probably will never do, <laughs> where I will set up my uh, RODI system with solenoids, which that's also in here. So, oh, here we go. I knew there's more pieces I hadn't shown you yet. So this is a solenoid. Water flows through it, and as you can see, it, it's for RO tubing. And this has a one-link connector on there. And so this right here could actually stop the flow going to an RODI system. So for example, if you had a leak detector from the Apex laying on the floor by your tank and it's getting wet, the Apex would then send you a notification saying there's a leak, there's a flood, there's an emergency. And because the Apex now knows there's a leak, it could then close the solenoid to stop any more water from being added from the RODI system if you had it set up that way. So you see, like I said, you can make this as complicated as you want or you can keep it super simple. I was trying to make an extra complication for myself. <laughs> I wanted to have two solenoids hooked up 
that would basically burn off the first 90 seconds of my RO water before I make DI water so my DI resin doesn't get wasted. Uh, I've talked about TDS creep in the past and I wanted to use that amount of that, uh, those pieces or components to uh, automate the 90 seconds I normally wait for the water to trickle out before I start making DI water. And so I spent, I don't know, $300 on pieces but it still requires me to climb through my attic to run an Aquabus cable from the fish room all the way back to the uh, RO system. I just have zero desire to climb in my attic and run this one cable. <clears throat> so I haven't used any of those parts. While I was looking at that box, I also noticed um, this is another optical sensor with a magnetic mount. So with this guy, you can actually mount your sensor inside a container magnetically and adjust it to the exact height you like and that way you can measure if the container is too low or if the container is too high. Some people like to use optical sensors to remind them to refill things they dose. Um, others use optical sensors to shut off their top-off system if the top-off container is empty so they don't burn up the pump. Um, others use it to say my sump is too full. Others use it to say my sump is too low. And matter of fact, I'm thinking about adding one for if my sump gets too low. And... What do you know? Holy cow, I didn't believe I have this. Here is an Apex Classic brick. <laughs> that is the original brain that I was using for years and years. And uh, it's uh, got the BNC connectors. It's got the, sorry, I have to do it with, with you guys. So you got serial port here. I'm saying everything wrong. Ethernet, it's BNC for PH and ORP, serial port, Ethernet, well, you get the idea. I'm saying some of this stuff wrong. I apologize. Aquabus, that's the temperature jack. This is going to be Ethernet. This one here. Every time I try and tell it to you, I see another thing I'm getting wrong. Thank God they label the front of it for you to <laughs> help you get it right, because Mark's going to steer you wrong. But the beauty of it is the instructions will really help you get it right. And I haven't used this one in a while, so I kind of forgot how things work. But it's a very simplistic thing to hook up, and you put your Aquabus cable in here. You put the other end into an energy bar, you plug the energy bar in the wall, and boom, this comes to life. Uh, I always use the Ethernet cable, like I said, to connect to it. And then I would hook up my temp, my pH, my ORP. And the other things I didn't use, I never used these ones on the end. That's why I was a little confused. That's some kind of variable speed thing for, like, pulsing uh, uh, oscillating pumps. And I don't, I don't do any of that. I just don't care about that. So I've never tried to dig into it or learn it. So... This right here is a leak detector sensor that would lay on the floor. It's got a wire that goes somewhere onto your system and it's very thin and if the bottom side senses water, it would then send you an alert. So, now that I've told you all that, here is Fusion on my phone and I can just scroll through it. Uh, something you may not be aware of is that every one of these <coughs> uh, buttons is covered with a protective shield so as you're scrolling you don't actually trigger something. You can just slide that open and now you can actually access it to touch it. Like You can set it to off or you can set it to on. What am I turning off? A heater? Or turn it on. I, I like to keep everything on auto and then you can close the door again so that we don't bump it accidentally. Now when I'm looking at my Trident which is a device that measures the water I showed you guys before. You can touch this once and it'll unfold and show you some graphs. You can touch it again. It shows you how much fluid is left for the, um, the reagents. And you can touch it again. It shows how much waste there is and how many tests are left. So that gives you some extra information to give you some updates. Now, uh, I was given the Trident to, oh, well, given, I had to buy it. Uh, as part of the testers group. That's why I have one already. Otherwise, I'd be waiting like most of you. And I know a lot of people are trying to get it right now. Matter of fact, I was reading on Facebook that one of the vendors was selling and they said, okay, we're just giving you guys a heads up in 30 minutes. We're going to sell some Tridents. We can't tell you how many, but we've got some. And they said they'd do it at 12. So, of course, everyone ran to that website and they were hitting refresh like crazy. And uh, that company, you know, the representative from that company said, during the first minute, from 12 to 12.01, 834 people were on the website. 
So that tells you how many people are interested in getting the Trident. And of course, only a couple of people are able to buy the ones that are available, and you have to wait for more to come in. So Neptune Systems is building more and more and more of them. Now, I didn't even show you guys the Trident, even though I've been over here talking about it. So I'm going to adjust this tripod towards the lower down to the ground. A second here to switch cameras for you. So this is the Trident right here. I've got it sitting up on a box. It's just a little bit higher than the rim of my sump. And there's a fixed amount of tubing coming out of this. I think it's like five feet of the intake and five feet of the output. And the one rule about the Trident is do not touch that tubing. You use exactly what they give you. You don't cut it shorter. You don't make it longer. Inside of that little uh, compartment, when you pull it out are the different uh, reagents and it is testing your water four times a day automatically and so every six hours I get an update. All right. Um, yeah, see someone says they heard they sold out in 12 seconds flat. It's crazy. Now I when I hooked mine up I didn't calibrate mine for at least a week maybe two, because I was part of the testing group and they told us when to calibrate. And they said, don't do it. So I didn't. And I don't think I'm revealing anything that's wrong. You know, in telling you, I just had to wait because that's not a secret. And then, uh, you know, I, I calibrated it and it would, you use this calibration solution they give you and it runs you through all the stuff, does all its tests, and then it's ready again to use your normal fluids and uh, you're back in business for another couple of months. So every time you buy reagents, you get a new calibration solution with it. And the calibration solution looks like this. And that would show you then the, what it should be in this bottle. These are the numbers that the Trident should be getting. So uh, in this case, it's showing a DKH at 8.4, calcium at 425, magnesium at 1470. So these are the numbers I should get after it's run through. Righty. <laughs> Rosano said they have hooked up 16 leak detectors in their basement. I think your floors are covered. Um, Kevin asks, is it possible to fully submerge a pH uh, probe? Yeah, you can. A lot of people like to keep the top extended above water. I've been just leaving them in the sump forever. But if you don't like them down in the water... I saw one here a second ago. This is a small box. What did I have? Well, I lost track of it. But uh, somewhere in this room around me was uh, an actual magnetic holder to hold all your probes and set it inside your sump wherever you want it. Weird. I was holding it, and now it's good. Oh, here it is. So there's your probe holder. And uh, it just holds on to this. Like I said, you put it on the sump wherever you like it. And I put mine in the skimmer section because that's where the water drains in. It's the raw water from the reef tank before it's gone through all the filtration. You could put it between your baffles. Since the water has to go through the baffles, that's a great spot as well. Um, and if the, the tops get wet, they get wet. I mean, think about this. If your probes are above the water, so here's your water line, here's your probe above it, right? Let's say it's that much higher. When you turn off the return pump and the water fills up, it's going to cover at the top of the probe anyway. So you see why I don't think it matters? that the probe got wet on top? Yeah. Uh, why is the Trident so hard to get? Uh, because they are building them as quickly as they can, and they're not Apple. <laughs> they're not Amazon. They're not a giant company. And so they are making them as quickly as they can. And you know, it's not just a matter of just put it together. They then have to put it on a bench test to make sure it's going to pass muster because when you get it, you're going to want to be happy. And if you get one that's just been slapped together in a hurry to get out the door so you could buy one really fast and you have problems, what are you going to tell the world? Oh, I bought one. It was a complete garbage. I hated my life. You know, it's like that's the kind of reactions that happen on these days on social media. So if there's a problem, you let them know and they'll take care of you. I mean, that's, that's what they do best. So I wouldn't ever worry about that one. 
Uh, Victor asks, how can I clean my Apex probes without damaging them? Well, my method has always been to just soak them in vinegar water or just vinegar. And then after five minutes, take them out and take a soft toothbrush and clean off the probe and clean, you know, like I'll hold the toothbrush and I'll put the probe against the bristles and kind of rotate gently. I'm not trying to dig in there. And also, in, let me show you the bad pH probe, the one I think I ruined because I probably won't be able to use it again. Where did I put that? Okay, so we're gonna take this one here. All right. Now, there's a lot of salt crystals in here. Let me rinse this off really quick. So this pH probe, as we look closer and closer at it, there is a uh, pointy tip right there. Uh, I need to get it where it focuses. And then there's also like a little nubby thing on the side. And you don't want to break off the nubby thing. You don't want to break off the little tiny itty bitty, there's a couple little white little teeth sticking up there or sensors. And you don't want to break those off either. So if you're cleaning with a toothpick, you want to get algae off, sure, but you don't want to break off those little sensors because once you break them off or break off the glass ball, you're going to buy a new probe. But most usually you can just soak them and then you can just rinse them off and then you can calibrate them again. So I hope that answered your question. All right. Ah, somebody asked about GHL. <laughs> so I picked this up while I was in Florida. This is potassium. And I did an ICP test uh, a few months ago. It's on my, it's on my website at milosreef.com blogs. And in there, I showed the full report. I haven't talked about this channel. And the one thing that my tank was deficient in was potassium. So I thought, okay, it's low. No. <laughs> That's as far as my brain took it. And then... I was listening to a, uh, to a talk when I was in Minneapolis and Terrence was giving the talk and he talked about water parameters and talked about the importance of certain elements that we tend to ignore, which potassium was one of them. So as he was talking, I opened up my blog and I looked at my ICP test and I said, I noticed it said 340. And he was saying that you want to be around 380, 400, 420, somewhere in there. And so my tank is significantly low in that area. Well, while I was in Florida a week later, I was talking to the GHL rep and I said, do you guys sell potassium that I can dose and do you sell a potassium test kit so I can actually measure? Because I'd bought a kit a long time ago and the kit didn't work for me and it was impossible to read. So this is the test kit that I got as well while I was there. So I got the test kit and the potassium. I'm planning to hook this up to the Camor dose pump and I'm gonna add in whatever I need to add uh, to raise my level up to get somewhere closer to 400. Now, why would you even care about potassium? What does potassium do? Well, we all know the Spock loves bananas, but this is not for Spock. <laughs> the uh, potassium is going to be taken up by the corals. So in theory, uh, from what has been discussed in the past, that when you run uh, potassium in a zeovit system, which zeovit dosing was very popular 10 years ago. It was expensive, but it was very popular. And those people had some really vivid colors and it was oftentimes because they attributed it to having the right amount of potassium, which the rest of us hobbyists were totally ignoring. So that was their secret ingredient. And, you know, we're always looking for that one ingredient that's going to make your reef look better. Well, my tank, for the most part, looks pretty. I, I'm very happy with it. You know, it has its ups and downs, but overall, you know, everything's doing well. And the one thing that uh, it could use is maybe a little bit more color. So I thought it's not going to hurt to put potassium in my system as long as I'm doing it properly and measuring. I'm not just pouring something in and hoping for the best. So that's why I'm using that. Uh, while I was there, I told her a story about a coral dip. So this is called Ultra Pest Control. It's coral dip. And years ago, long time ago, our club's president handed me this little glass vial. Very thin, you know, just like, like a straw. 
and inside it was a little bit of this. And he said, these are free samples from Fauna Marin. Check it out. So I was like, all right. And it was amazing, and it really killed all kinds of pests. So I was like, fantastic. Where do I get more of this? And he says, I don't know. <laughs> and it's, I thought maybe it was one of those things where they made samples to see how people would react. You know, it, would it be a seller? And then I just kind of, for some reason, assumed it didn't make it to market. So I mentioned that to her in the store, and she goes, oh, yeah, we sell it. We still have some. You want some? So I got myself a bottle of it for a coral dip. As you guys know, I always like to get another coral dip. I'm always finding something on the market. Even though I know a lot of people like to use the stuff from uh, Bayer, um, I've chosen not to. Uh, just because, you know, the one negative I've heard about using Bayer is that you pour it in the water and the water turns like milk and you can't even see in the water anymore to even see the corals. So, I mean, yeah, it's going to kill everything off the coral, but it may also, uh, it might even kill the coral because you couldn't see it and you left it in there to die. So you're having to reach through and sieve through the milky water trying to find it. Anyway, I just felt like, no, I'm not going to use that. I'll use something I can see through. So I've used Revive. Um, I've used uh, they called it one dip and then I've used something called one shot which is something that I also got at Macna that has still not come to market but so she showed me this and then she says but Mark we also have the dip so I got that bottle as well so I have plenty of coral dip over here you should not be seeing any pests in my aquarium anytime soon and one of the things she was telling me about this one if I remember correctly she said it even handled acre eating flatworms. So that would be a pretty great thing to use. Keep in mind that any of these chemicals that you use always are used outside the tank. They're used for dips. They're not used to add to your tank when you already have a pest in there. Wow. Are we talking about potassium, Salty Lou? You keep yours at 600? I'm going to assume your corals are the most colorful in the nation. That's really high. Um, and Steel76 asks, or says he's a huge fan of the Ur Reef skimmers, which were, uh, they're no longer in existence other than mine when used. Um, great skimmer, used mine for almost 14 years, but I replaced it with a Nios, and I'm loving the Nios. So let me tell you the difference between my Euro Reef and my Nios. The Euro Reef was a little bit bigger, and it used two large pumps uh, that were Eheims. And I replaced it with a Nios that has two smaller pumps inside of it, it's using, I believe, one-third less power, and it's dead silent, and it's doing a great job. I mean, my tank doesn't have algae problems. So uh, comparing apples to apples, I would say that the Nios is equivalent to the Euro Reef, and if you were looking to get a Nios, then it would be a great purchase. And it's one of the reasons that you see Nios skimmers on my website. Uh, Kev Davies asks on the subject of potassium, what is the level regarded as a correct level? I would definitely look it up, but I'm hearing that basically shooting for 400 should be your goal. And the nice thing is, even if you can't read a test kit properly, but you're dosing it, when you send in the ICP test occasionally to get a measurement of your tank, you'll be able to find out uh, where you're at now and see if you're close to your target, if you overshot it, um, if you need to back off, you know, or if you need to put in a little bit more than you've been using. Like, for example, I sent mine in and it came back at 340. Let's say I dose an entire bottle of this stuff over the next month and a half. And then I send in a test and it says I'm at 380. I'm like, I'm on the right track. If it says I'm at 500, I have used way too much. But, you know, I'll follow the instructions. By the way, I do want to tell you this because I heard it. You know, it's, there's always those little things you hear in conversation and, you know, they just kind of click with me. So a lot of people, like you and I, will buy a bottle and then what do we do? We read the instructions of how to use it. Well, according to Fauna Marin, while there are instructions on their bottles, they always have better instructions on their website. So they were recommending, you know, when you're going to do something, look it up on the website and read everything there to get way more information. And that way you'll know exactly how to dose it properly. So I just wanted to share that with you guys just in case uh, you're like me and you just read the, the little, you know, the, the three sentences on the bottle and assume that's all I need to know. There could be you need to know more. Uh, Reef and Dive says his ORP is always around 180. The tank is healthy. Could that number be okay? I would say that your ORP probe needs to be replaced because that's a really low number. Um, the highest we would like to have ORP in a tank, which is oxygen reduction potential, is uh, I think the number was 425. And when I 
showed you guys that one picture of mine. It was uh, measuring at 336. I tend to be around 320 to 340 on my tank all the time. And I'm not doing a lot with that probe. You know, it's sort of like a watch dog type situation. Where you just kind of glance at it, make sure it's okay. Uh, it's not some number that I'm like, oh, the number has gotten to here. But if mine dipped to 180, I would definitely look into my tank to see what's going on and see what I can do to solve it. All right, let me scroll way up because I'm sure I missed at least a few questions in here. Uh, while I'm killing some time here for a second. <laughs> Fun with reefing! Ugh. Okay, I'm going to put this on the screen because he's right. Did I miss the Tammy's Reef in the calcium reactor video? I can't find them anywhere. That's because they're still on my hard drive. But that is what I was ta about to tell you. I was about to change gears. So I... I I think I mentioned to you guys a month ago, I bought a brand new external RAID array hard drive. It's a 12 terabyte hard drive to hold all my video files. And as you know, earlier this year, I bought the iMac 27 inch with a super processor and you know, a ton of RAM. And I've got fiber connections here where I have high speed to do uploads to YouTube. And all I needed was time to sit down and edit videos. And June is my month to sit down and edit a bunch of videos. Now. I'm not going to make any kind of promise that this is what's going to happen, but I would love to take time pretty much every evening in June and knock out a video. That doesn't mean I'm going to upload 30 videos in a month. <laughs> but if I did, so be it. You've been warned. It's a possibility because I really want these things off my hard drive and on YouTube to where you can watch them. So. There may be an overload. If you're like, oh my God, here comes another one, I apologize. I have not given you videos in a while, and so it's gonna kind of steamroll for a little bit. And that's just how it's gonna be. So uh, I just wanna let you know, I've, last night I spent time with my friend Ian over in Florida, and he was giving some more tutorials of Final Cut Pro and Keyflow Pro, and I finally figured out how to use my external wireless microphone with my iMac to where I can test my narration as I'm actually in the middle of an edit. Because one of my challenges that was really driving me a little bit batty was I plug in this device in the back, you know, the back of the Mac, to have a microphone on me. And I, I narrate. And then when I'm done and I want to play it back and make sure it's right, I have to unplug the jack. Well, if I have to unplug and plug in this jack a hundred times during one video edit, I feel like I'm going to ruin the jack on my Mac. I mean, it's just not designed for a headphone or a microphone to be plugged in a hundred times per session, you know, during a couple hour period, I would just burn up that jack in, you know, in a month. So I don't want to ruin my computer, and I was trying to find a solution. I found a solution, and I'm really happy about it. And we're actually on this mic right now through my solution, which is using something called uh, USB-C or Thunderbolt 3 or something like that. And now that I'm doing that, I don't have to use that jack, and I can hit record, and I can record, and then I can hit playback and hear it through the speakers, and I'm super happy about that because the whole point of editing videos, for me, is simplicity. And the more complicated and hard it is, the more I'm going to put it off, just like our reef tanks. We have to really work on them. Uh, we tend to put it off. But if we can just kind of like tinker with it and keep it happy, we usually don't mind, and we enjoy our, our, our setups. So, scroll down. Um, tanked it up, asked me a while back, I apologize, I hope you're still here, um, asked me how long has this tank been up? This has been running for four, five and a half years. Um, hey Ed, thanks for letting me know about the audio when I was in the sump room. I'm not really surprised. I'm sure there was some RF interference. And then Green Navy actually asked here earlier, does Nopox kill off the refugium? No, mine's completely lush. I'm not having any problems. My macroalgae looks great. Matter of fact, I need to get rid of some because it's too full. Um, <laughs> okay, Sean. Way to be a trooper, stranded on the side of the road with a flat motorcycle tire, but tuning in to watch the live stream. That's awesome. I hope by now someone has picked you up. 
Oh, uh, thank you, Rasta Reefer. Apparently, I said it wrong uh, before about the Apex. The smaller version is the EL, not the LE. See, in the old days, we had corals that were called coral, like uh, Green Slime or LE, which stood for a limited edition. But EL is standing for something else, like, uh, I don't know. It's just a junior version. So thanks for correcting me on that. My mistake. Um, Lithuanian fishermen, I am sorry to tell you that my dwarf moray eels are, they are reef safe, but they are gone. So I can't add them to my tank because I don't have them anymore. This is a great question. Okay, Ravinder, if you have the Apex Classic and you want to uh, get the new Apex, yes, you have to program the whole thing. But the, there's a simple, it's tedious, but there's a simple workaround where you're not completely from scratch. I mean, obviously you can use tasks to do a lot of things to do things quickly. For example, on the uh, programming for my lighting, for example, I tell my lights to turn on at one o'clock and turn off at seven o'clock. Okay, it's a simple on at 1300, off at 1700, oh, I'm sorry, at uh, 1900. So at 1901, the light turns off. I mean, it's a real simple program. But then you have extra code you can add, for example, if the tank gets too hot, turn off the lights. And so I do if temperature is greater than uh, 82 degrees, turn off metal halide one. And that kind of coding isn't just a default necessarily in ta even though that one's kind of covered <laughs> but i mean my point is some things may not be in task that you need to add yourself afterwards and you can do that now what you can do with your apex classic you go into fusion and you click in the upper left screen and there will be your name up there when you hit it a huge long menu appears on the screen and on the lower part of the menu says summary you click summary and then there's the option to print out all your programming and what I do is I hit print, but I don't actually print. I save it as a PDF file on my computer. And now I have all of my code for the entire Apex in a PDF file. Then when you set up your new Apex, you log into Indiffusion and you're ready to start putting in your code. You can open the PDF file and you can copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste, and get everything set up. And that's the most simplistic way of describing how it's done. It, it's quite an ordeal. It's not something you'll knock out in a couple hours. It'll probably take you all day long, but uh, it is the way to copy it. There's no way to like just download from the cloud and upload to the cloud, which would be amazing, but that's not an option. And so, yeah, there is some effort involved. And what you can do if you buy the new one, you can hook up the new one and you can keep the old one running at the same time. And that way you can kind of program the new one and get it all ready while the old one is still taking care of your tank. Um, this question came up before from Michael. He was saying uh, he can't run a skimmer because it's noisy. Um, and so I'm running a 50 micron sock. Is there anything else I can do? Well, you can get a quieter skimmer. Like I said, the Nile skimmer is dead silent. You won't hear it at all. And uh, no, I mean, the other choice is no sock, no nothing, and just do water changes. I'm sorry, guys, I'm still catching up on old questions here, trying to things, you know, when I was off talking, I wasn't reading the screen. This question, I don't know the answer to. So I'm not familiar with Direct Connect, um, unless you're talking about my Ethernet cable. If that's the case, then that's what I'm using. Oh, you mean local. Yeah, yeah, actually, I have both choices. I can use Apex Fusion, which works wherever you are on any tablet, anything has a browser, or you can use Apex Local, which works while you're at home and uh, it, it logs in locally. And yeah, I use both. As a matter of fact, Local now looks like Fusion. I think the only difference is they made the background a slightly different color to remind you that you're in Local. I was thinking Direct Connect. Um, and then this question here said they use two bags of fine live sand and it keeps blowing around. Well, you're gonna have to use your adjustments on your power heads. 
change the flow pattern, change the flow power, adjust the angle, the tilt to help keep your sand in place. But if you put crushed coral in there, what will happen is it will probably lay on the surface and trap a lot of detritus and you'll end up with nitrate issues. So I would focus on trying to adjust the flow patterns in the tank and let the sand kind of settle in. You also mentioned it was a new tank and it takes a little while for the sand bed to get established and uh, stay, in, stay in place. So Tulsa Area Reef Club says, do you, use your, do you control your calcium reactor with the Apex? Not quite yet, but that's when I mentioned before I need to buy the PM1. Once I buy the PM1, then I will. I'm going to hook up the PM1 module to my Apex. I'm going to take the pH probe off my calcium reactor that's going to a Milwaukee controller and go into the PM1. And then I'm going to use the command structure in Apex because the Trident is measuring alkalinity. I can say if alkalinity is less than 9.2, turn on the CO2 to the calcium reactor and make it make more alkalinity. And then when the pH or the alkaline gets a little higher, I can say turn off the CO2. So I'm going to be using the PM1 module to now trigger on and off when CO2 feeds to the calcium reactor to add the alkalinity to the tank. But, and so the Trident does something, I've, I've used this phrase a few times now, it allows me to be lazy and yet informed. And I love that. Because I can, anytime I want, you know, matter of fact, I get reminders because, you know, it comes to life at 6 and then at 12 and then at 6 and then at 12. I hear it whirring to life. And I know in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to get a response. I'm going to know what the latest numbers are. And I've been watching my alkalinity for the last week. And it has been pretty much right around 9.3 all the time, which is awesome. Because in the past, without that device, what I would do is I would pull up my test kit. I would mix it all up, measure it all, and say, okay, my alkaline is 10. It's a little high. Let me make an adjustment. And then fast forward a week or two, and I test alkaline again. It's like, oh, it's 8. It's a little low. Let me make an adjustment. Well, since I've been using the Trident to kind of be more on top of knowing alkalinity every single day, if not a couple times a day, I'm able to, I was able to dial it in and get it right at 9.3 and stay there, which has been great. And I know it's hard to see this stuff on the live stream you know, because the colors are never right, but this is all SPS corals. And all of these, and these are not little tiny frags. I mean, these are colonies that are about that big around that are sucking up alkalinity and calcium nonstop, and they're doing really well. So my calcium reactor is keeping up just fine. My melt point, which is the level of the pH within the reactor, is actually high enough that I can lower it to make even more alkalinity if I needed to, but I don't need to. And it's making things very simple for me, which is nice. I really do like that. Um, Kevin Jones says he just got a bubble tip anemone. Congratulations. I love bubble tips. And I'm glad to hear it's settling in. A lot of talk about moving sand. Okay, I answered all of those questions. <clears throat> yeah, do not let your RODI system flood your home. This is your reminder. It's so easy to forget those, you know. All right. Valhalla says your 10-year-old daughter says hi. Hi there. Um, Glenn asks, what does the quarterly cost of, uh, oh, hang on, this one. What is the cost for the reagents? Do you have to pay a monthly subscription um, with the Apex sending me messages? Actually, I would love a subscription, to be honest, rather than me having to go and get the uh, various, you know, take the time to go to the shop and buy it. But for now, you just buy it. And each time you buy a kit, you're going to get four bottles of reagents, two alkalinity, one calcium, one magnesium, and then you get a fifth bottle. That's the calibration solution I showed you guys. And that roughly is $45 uh, shipment. 
So talking, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of opinions about the Trident, but you could say the same thing for Alcatronic, or you could say the same thing for Reefbot and these other different devices that cost you six hundred, eight hundred, a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars, whatever it costs. Other people say, well, I can use it with, I can buy test kits for a hundred dollars or less and be just fine. And yeah, you absolutely can be. We have made it this far in reefing history without these devices. In the last couple of years, new gizmos have come to market that have made our life easier but cost money. Um, and I can compare this very simply to how about the old days of cellular telephones? Back in the 80s and in the 90s, you know, the late 80s, the cellular phone came out. And you see it in the movies, and it's this ginormous thing he's holding in his, against his ear. He's driving down the highway. And then later on, they came out with the flip phone that you could shove in your pocket. And then, you know, I think it was 2009 when the Apple iPhone came out, and the world lost its mind. And now, and back then, stay, you know, 10 years ago, you could get the iPhone for free if you agreed to sign up with AT&T for two years, right? So everyone bought a two-year contract to get their free phone, and they learned that they could do more than make a phone call. They could get on the internet. They could take pictures. They could uh, send messages through text instead of leaving a voicemail. And, you know, we are now 10 years later, we have cell phones that cost $1,600, and we buy the newest one, even though the one we used to get was free and did what we needed, but we still like better technology. So the Trident is better technology and lets you stay on top of your tank. And if you're a traveler or if you're a guy that's at home with your tank all day long, it still will automate things that maybe you don't like doing. And I always tell you guys, it's water test Saturday. And I know that I've been ingraining that in your head for the last year and a half or two years on this live stream saying, we've got to test our water. And I still come across people saying, yeah, I need to start doing that. Well, the Trident will do it for you, so you don't have to think about it. And then all you have left to test is going to be uh, phosphate and nitrate. And, you know, of course, if you want to check out the things, you can. But the point, you know, like salinity. <laughs> but it's just nice to have a device that will do it for you. But it's going to cost money. Just like if you hired a, uh, okay, let's take, for example, because dollars are dollars. It's true. Spending money for this machine and then spending money for the reagents for the rest of your life is going to add up. But if you hired a tank maintenance company to come to your house and change your water and do the test once every two weeks or once a month, what would that cost you? Is it kind of the equivalent? Is it cheaper? Is it more? I don't know. But I, I can accept this price. I can accept this cost because it's pretty neat. And it's, it really is convenient. So I, I really do like it. Let's see. Yagi one asked, uh, "They's out of aqua bus cables. What's the best way to add more?" Well, you just buy more. <laughs> uh, you can get them everywhere. Uh, BRS sells them. Uh, Premium Aquatics, Marine Depot, uh, probably the Neptune store might even sell it. I don't even know. Um, whenever I need stuff, I uh, I just hit the web and I start looking for who sells it. T. Plummer asks, are you still making custom sumps and refugiums? Absolutely. I just shipped out a huge order a couple weeks ago, and I've shipped out some smaller things this week. I'm always building acrylics things for my customers. Um, Daryl says, how did you get the amperage tile on your fusion? And uh, I was able to, um, I think it came, oh, it may be hiding, at the top of Fusion, there's a little padlock, and you unlock it, and then this new panel like unfolds and opens up, and you slide left to right, and you'll find extra things that are invisible. You can drag them onto your main Fusion and hit the padlock and close that thing. That's your little file cabinet for things you never care about. And so I've got all my Fusion, uh, I've got all my amperage ratings on there now that I can actually see how much power each one is pulling. Answered that, answered that.
Uh, ATF in the house is saying, are there alternatives to Apex and Trident systems? Is there something less expensive or less complex, especially for multiple tanks? Is there some simple solution? Well, I mean, there's always a, a brand on the market. E Coral came out with a new controller a year and a half ago that might be at, it might be for sale now on the market. I mean, when they're showing it to us, it was, I think it was right there packaged, but maybe hasn't hit the shops yet. But at this point, you can probably buy it. Um, there are other controllers on the market. Uh, GHL has a huge controller that is very popular because you have like this router uh, box that um, you can unscrew the cover, take it off, and you can actually put in all the pieces you want, like a PC. You know, like, I don't need a modem, but I need a this. And you put that thing in. And you can actually build your controller exactly with the components you want, and then hook it all up to your tank. So, yeah, there's other choices. But uh, it's all going to add up. In the end, you're going to spend money. <laughs> Will it be less expensive? Don't know. Uh, Eastlat says, did you have to take any precautions about adding more salt water to make up for what the Trident is pulling out? You know, no. And the Trident is pulling out, I believe, 100 milliliters per day. So every 10 days, it pulls out one liter of water. A liter of water is basically a quart, right? So I'm losing a quart of water from a 450 gallon system. And, you know, my system tops off automatically anyway. So, you know, I guess if you went 12 months, there's a good chance that my salinity will have dropped a little bit. But that's why we measure salinity, make sure it's where it needs to be, or we add more salt water to replenish. So, no, I don't think that's a, a factor. Now, if I had the Trident hooked up to a 34-gallon aquarium, yeah, it's a chance that you need to be aware of what it's pulling out. But, I mean, you could say the same thing about a skimmer pulling out skim mate. And if your skimmer is pulling out watery skim mate and a lot of it, it could actually affect your salinity the same way. It's pulling out the liquid, your top off is adding fresh water, and it's throwing off the numbers. So it comes down to testing our water. But no, I don't think it's pulling out that much liquid to where you have to worry. Now, another thing a lot of people don't know or get confused on is that the waste line coming out of the trident goes into a waste collector or into a drain. You can't just drain it back into your tank. And I know that uh, the Alcatronic, you know, measures alkalinity, when it's done, it flushes that stuff back into the tank, and I'm actually amazed that that's okay. I mean, I have no idea what's in that solution. I don't even know what the test chemical physically is, but it blows me away to think that I could measure alkalinity, and then when I'm done, pour it in my tank. Like, okay, that was what it was. That's crazy to me. So, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's just color. <laughs> no idea what's in that stuff. <laughs> Uh, David says, do you notice any better growth of the calcium reactor versus two part? I love the calcium reactor and I've been using one since 2004 and I've been doing two part of my frag tank that is never happy. So I'm not saying the two part can't do it. It definitely can. I'm not staying on top of it adequately enough to say it's just as good as. I find the calcium reactor to be far easier, less time consuming, less hands on than dosing because with dosing, you got to mix up solutions on a regular basis and replenish. You've got to make sure your dosing pumps are working properly, that the liquid is coming out of the tubing properly. If there's a, a break in the line, you have to correct that. If there's a programming is lost, you have to reprogram it. Um, as the tank grows, you have to adjust to make, to you know, get the numbers back where they need to be. It just seems like you're constantly having to adjust the, the volume control <laughs> on your TV. I want to hit the TV, get the volume right, and watch a movie. I don't have to keep going up and down with the volume the entire movie. And that's kind of my comparison to two-part on a reef tank. It just seems like you're always having to work. But for smaller aquariums, like a 29-gallon aquarium or a 14-gallon or something like that, dosing two-part, like B-Ionic, is exactly what I did for years. And it was easy. You put it into a little cup and you poured it in your tank and then you put it a little bit more in the cup and you pour it in the tank and you're done. And I did that once a day forever <laughs> for three years. And it worked great on that tank. I didn't have a calcium reactor on that tank. But for some reason, my frag tank and I just don't have the best relationship in the world. Uh, I don't know this one. Uh, I'm not familiar with I haven't looked into Aquatronica, so I can't give you any kind of thoughts on that. But if I see it at Macna, I'll learn about it just so I get to see what it is. Because, like, you know, there's always something new on the market, and I do like to see what's out there.
Um, okay, back to the Aquabus ports. I saw a question that I think he was talking about being out of Aquabus or maybe Aquabus cable ports. Um, I wanted to tell you that each of these, you know, like the old energy bar has the Aquabus, you know, there's six on here, right? This one has three on it. And then, um, for example, this one module has two on it. The beauty of Aquabus cables is you can run a cable from device to device to device to device. You can daisy chain everything. And as long as everything is connected all the way down, even the, lat the guy at the far end will reach all the way to the, the brain at the first end. So if you're running out of ports, find something you can add that has more ports. Maybe the PM1 has some extra ports you could use. Or adding another energy bar, because there's always more things you have to plug in. That gives you, you know, three to six new Aquabus ports to plug into. But, uh, I mean, I think you're allowed to plug in like 256 different items all together. Worst case scenario. So it, it's kind of a, it's nice in that regard. And that's why I'm able to have one power brick way, way up here. You know, I'm going to point up here. Like way over here. And then I have one way down there, and I have one over there, and I have another one under the Nenima Cube, and I'm talking about putting one by the RODI system. So, I mean, you know, you can have stuff everywhere. As long as you can get an Aquabus cable to reach that far, you're set. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, Current USA came out with a control or some kind. I think it was called E-Loop. And, but that's one tank. I don't think you can daisy chain multiple tanks, but it kind of, everything would talk to itself on the same aquarium. It was like the lights and the controller and the pumps, the top off all work together in conjunction. That was pretty cool. So that's another one that might be available. You can check into that. I've caught up on all the questions. So yeah. Um, that's pretty much it for today, guys. We've we've covered a lot. I just wanted to give you guys a live stream about the Apex because I've never really taken the time to talk about it on this channel. Uh, even though I use it all the time, I just, there's really a lot. I could make this super crazy complicated and add some very specific stuff and I'd lose 95% of you. And there'd be like five people like, oh my God, that was fantastic. That totally helped me. So I'm just gonna say, go to the forums that help people with Neptune systems. Uh, go to the Facebook page, you know, on, where they have a group where they help with the Apex because those guys will show you code. You can paste your code in and they can say, no, that's wrong. Take out that one line. And then you can reinsert in your thing and upload to the cloud and boom, you're corrected and you're happy. So that's why there hasn't been like a full-fledged video about that topic. But who knows? Maybe at some point I'll do something creative. Uh, I've got this idea of something I'd like to do, but it may be... Uh, way more work than it's worth. <laughs> Other than that, um, it is water test Saturday. Uh, we've talked about testing a whole bunch in this this show today, but I do got, I do want you guys to test your water. I already know three of my elements, well, four, five actually, because of my apex. So I know temperature, pH, alkaline, calcium, magnesium. Uh, I need to test phosphate and I need to test nitrate. Um, and I guess I need to test potassium. <laughs> so that will be a new one for me, testing K. But uh, next Saturday we'll be doing another live stream during this week. I hope to roll out a few videos, so that'll be nice. Um, get you guys caught up on some of the things that I have not been able to share thus far that I've just been amassing on my phone and then eventually onto my hard drive. And uh, you know, of course, at some point I will give you another update on Nopox. And right now I, I'm just. I feel like I'm getting close to where I need to be, but I'm not quite on the part where I can say it's done. So we'll see. But it was eight weeks ago as of um, Friday. So as of yesterday, I've dosed for eight weeks straight of 40 milliliters a day into my 450 gallon tank. And, um, you know, I haven't lost things, which is great, you know, because when you sit there and you put in all this these chemicals in your tank, you, you, you get worried. Is it going to hurt something? Is it going to cause damage? Is it going to... Is, it, is the change going to kill my livestock? And I don't want to hurt anything. I just wanted to kind of get it a little bit better because I'd like to add some more fish. And if I want to add more fish, i got to feed more. And if I'm going to feed more, I'm going to raise my nitrates up. So I want to bring them down to where I have the ability to add more fish in. Chad, thank you very much for that super chat. I really appreciate that. 
And uh, that's it, guys. Uh, I hope you have a great weekend, and I will talk to you guys next Saturday at 2 o'clock Central Time. So I shall say goodbye.